So, I'm a clinical research fellow with the OPDC study team, and today I would like to convince you of uh, the, uh, how neuropathological research on the human brain is absolutely necessary to uh, further our understanding of the mechanisms underlying Parkinson's disease, and how this can then help us develop better treatment, and hopefully, ideally, maybe even prevent the disease. I will start by reading a quote that I found in a journal on, neuro on uh, neurodegenerative disease. Um, this is a variation of a uh, basically a background theme, so it cannot be really attributed to a single person. So the human brain has evolved in a very specific way, bringing forth language, consciousness, and self-awareness. It seems that there are also disorders that are specific to the human brain. For example, Alzheimer's disease Parkinson's disease and other proteinopathies have no real equivalent in the animal kingdom. So as you reflect on this, I will start telling you about the first major breakthrough uh, in the uh, definition of Parkinson's disease from a neuropathological point of view, which uh, occurred about a hundred years ago when novel staining techniques developed by Bilshovsky and Nissel, amongst others, revolutionized neuropathological research on the brain and allowed Frederick Louis to uh, discover that essentially all brains from Parkinson's disease patients uh, contained many neurons which contained characteristic round inclusions which were which are these that you see here in his original drawings and then in a, in a kind of a different staining technique and these were named uh, Louis bodies unsurprisingly and since then, they have been established as the hallmark lesion, the sort of signature of Parkinson's disease. And this has allowed to uh, differentiate Parkinson's disease from a myriad of other clinically similar syndromes. And this, in turn, has allowed for better definition, both from a clinical and a biochemical point of view, of Parkinson's disease. The next important chapter in the Louis body, in the story of Louis bodies, came about 20 years ago when Maria Spilantini and her team were able to uh, define what Louis bodies are actually made of. So they built, <coughs> they, they, they used data from genetic studies showing that mutations in the gene coding for alpha-synuclein can cause hereditary forms of Parkinson's disease. And they developed antibodies against this protein and they showed that alpha-synuclein is the major constituent of Louis bodies. So this is one example of how genetic studies can inform neuropathological research and how neuropathological research can uh, then uh, uh, show that these findings are consistent and, uh, and uh, sort of demonstrate biologically findings from genetic research. Also, from this point onwards, there was a target that one could work on to develop therapeutic approaches. And just very recently, uh, uh, several studies have started looking into the possibility of developing immune therapy to try to slow or halt neurodegeneration by attacking um, misfolded alpha-synuclein. So until the 1960s, it was not clear which biochemical <coughs> alteration caused the clinical, the clinical syndrome of Parkinson's disease. And building on work by Arvid Carlson on animal models, and again, taking advantage of novel neuropathological techniques uh, that allowed quantification of neurotransmitters in the brain, uh, Ole Hornikiewicz decided to measure dopamine levels. <coughs> and he compared these measurements between brains from Parkinson's disease patients and brains from uh, neurologically unimpaired <coughs> controls. And he consistently found lower dopamine levels in the deep basal ganglia of the brains of Parkinson's disease patients. And this was caused by a loss of fibers, uh, nerve fibers projecting from the midbrain, <coughs> which produced uh, dopamine. And, and so these fibers were lost. Now, with this truly groundbreaking discovery, there was reason to believe that one could try to supplement what was missing. And so Hornikiewicz and his colleagues decided to try using uh, levodopa, 
which was a, is the precursor of dopamine and had been lying around in labs for some years. And uh, this then eventually was tested and applied and uh, showed it was, uh, and, um, turned out to be a very uh, good symptomatic treatment, which significantly improved quality of life in, in many people with Parkinson's disease. About 10 years ago, another uh, major discovery based on neuropathological research on brains was, um, was reported by Professor Brock and his, and his team. Uh, they again studied uh, uh, brains, uh, several regions of, of, of the brains of people who had had Parkinson's disease in several different clinical phases of the disease. And uh, so they were allowed, they, they, uh, they managed to develop a model uh, of progression of pathology from the lower brainstem up into the higher brainstem and then finally reaching the uh, neocortical regions, which um, reflected the clinical progression of the disease. So this, for the first time, was, an, was a model which um, was based on a dynamic progression of pathology, not on, on a concept of fixed pathology in, 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 in Parkinson's disease. Also, uh, these studies uh, highlighted through histopathological observation of, of, brain, uh, of the brain that certain neuronal uh, types, certain brain regions and certain types of neurons were more vulnerable to uh, pathology than others. And uh, specifically, um, <coughs> neurons whose axons were covered in, in a coat of myelin seemed to be protected compared to, ac to neurons whose axons were not uh, myelinated. Um, and also the length of the axons was sort of a risk factor uh, for, for, for involvement uh, of pathology. So with the, with the idea of selective vulnerability, uh, again, uh, there were potential targets that could be explored for a therapeutic approach. And just going back to the, to the slide I showed you about the um, discovery of dopamine depletion in the brain, uh, in an attempt to compensate for this loss of dopamine, several groups uh, about 20 years ago uh, tried transplanting uh, midbrain neurons from fetuses directly into the brain of patients with Parkinson's disease where these cells could release dopamine. Now while unfortunately the therapeutic effects were not as ideal as had been hoped for, post-mortem analysis of brains from some of these patients showed not only what could have been expected and confirmed Parkinson's disease, so Lewy bodies, alpha-synuclein positive Lewy bodies in um, the host tissue, but also morphologically and biochemically identical lesions in the, in the tissue that had been transplanted. So these were young, genetically independent cells that had developed pathology, which suggested that pathology must have somehow been transmitted from the host. This was, was defined as the prion-like hypothesis, the hypothesis of prion-like propagation because of similarities with what happens in prion disease. And with, with this um, idea and model in mind, uh, it was now attractive and possible indeed to try to characterize, the, uh, uh, characterize, characterize pathologically the clinical syndrome of Parkinson's <coughs> disease uh, going beyond the motor phase back to the pre-motor phase uh, in which symptoms uh, such as constipation and, uh, and hyposmia can be present for years before the onset of motor symptoms. So the idea being that one could actually find pathology that correlates with these symptoms far away from the brain and then through selective vulnerability this pathology could propagate uh, to, to the brainstem and then onwards. The, the idea of prion-like propagation, this model, has been confirmed with several animal and cell models that have, that have shown that alpha-synuclein can actually uh, be transmitted from cell to cell and that it can cause pathologic alpha-synuclein, can cause misfolding of nearby normal alpha-synuclein. So I hope that I've convinced you that uh, neuropathology, at least in the past and until very recently, uh, or until our, our days, I would say, has been crucial in uh, understanding more of the disease by def better definition, providing targets uh, for treatment, and modeling the progression of pathology and thus trying to bring the focus uh, to uh, ways of predicting the disease. And uh, what we are doing now, um, 
in terms of neuropathological research um, with uh, obviously the participation of the people in the discovery cohort, we have two goals, uh, essentially, main goals. One is to further our understanding of selective vulnerability using genetics as a guide. And the other is to look at the possibility of detecting uh, alpha-synuclein in, in um, colonic tissue, so in, in the large bowel, essentially, in the samples that have been taken for several possible reasons, uh, as a possible biomarker for Parkinson's disease. And the kind of biomarker that this may turn out to be is still not quite clear, but it could, could be several types of, of biomarker. And I'll just give you a quick update on, um, on these two themes. So talking about selective vulnerability, there is this idea and, and, and has been shown that several, that specific neurons are more prone to develop pathology. And going to the midbrain, we know that um, neurons in a, in a very specific region that are here in this uh, black area are the ones that are preferentially uh, uh, hit by pathology. And these are dopaminergic neurons, but these neighboring cells are also dopaminergic neurons, but for some reason they seem to be protected and uh, less, uh, less involved by pathology. So um, in, in our laboratory, we can, we can use a microscope uh, coupled with a laser that can actually cut these cells out of the surrounding tissue. So we want to pool, we're going to pool the more vulnerable cells into one group and the uh, protected cells into another group. And we will compare how risk genes are expressed in these two groups and there, if there are differences in this expression. And when I say risk genes, I refer, whoops, how can I go back here? Uh, I refer to uh, genetic studies. Uh, so studies based on populations. I'd like to go back to that other slide, but. Okay. <laughs> Almost. I'll just do this. Sorry. I think this is a useful diagram. OK, so <coughs> these, these, these studies uh, are study the DNA of, of, of large sample, large numbers of people, and um, they then pinpoint regions of DNA that show a strong association with Parkinson's disease. And uh, in some cases, such as the ones shown here, this is rather intuitive. This is the kind of the signal for alpha-synuclein gene, and this is the signal for the tau gene, which have been established to be very uh, obviously strongly associated to Parkinson's disease. But in other cases, genes are come up from these studies that mm, are not clearly related to Parkinson's disease. So it makes sense to assess whether the expression of these genes, whether the amount of product in terms of RNA, which is an intermediate that then leads to proteins from these genes, so if the amount of product of these genes varies significantly between people with Parkinson's disease and people without, because then it would make sense to further understand the function of these products and try to uh, look for possible targets again of therapy. And the other theme is that of colonic alpha-synuclein. So um, here, as you all know, we, we, we ask all participants in the cohort if they've had biopsies in the past, and then we try to retrieve this tissue. We actually do retrieve it in most cases. And the tissue is then stained for alpha-synuclein. And uh, uh, this is uh, building on evidence from uh, recent studies that show that you can uh, find pathology, su uh, pathology suggestive of Parkinson's disease, so alpha-synuclein positive lesions such as these, in peripheral tissue, uh, not only uh, to confirm the diagnosis, but in a few cases, uh, this has been reported to happen before the onset of motor symptoms, uh, as much as eight years before the onset of motor symptoms. These findings need to be replicated. They are preliminary, but it, it, does, uh, uh, it does mean that one could eventually use uh, this kind of marker to predict uh, Parkinson's disease and to then have the opportunity of trying potentially neuroprotective therapy in people where um, neuronal loss has not begun. So in a, in, a, in a phase preceding that of motor symptoms. However, I do have to tell you that these the preliminary results that we have found so far are promising but not definitive. Uh, immunohistochemistry, such as this, uh, such, such as that which produces these images, 
seems not to be sensitive and specific enough to distinguish these, these groups. So we are uh, trying to develop new techniques that will increase our uh, accuracy and detail in defining uh, <coughs> what we can use to then make a diagnosis, possibly follow the progression of disease and, and, and predict it to then apply therapeutic approaches. Just a quick uh, update on brain banking. So this is a well-established concept. Uh, so brain banks collect and store brains of deceased people who had neurodegenerative diseases, but not only. And importantly, um, brains from people that were neurologically unimpaired. This is very important to understand more of the disease condition. And they then distribute frozen tissue or formalin-fixed tissues to different research groups. And this is another important concept, the fact that there are networks there are networks of brain banks. Um, the uh, brain bank that uh, for the Parkinson's UK, based at Imperial College in London, is part of a network of 19 brain banks across Europe. Um, so to date, um, many of you know we are, we are trying to promote uh, brain donation. Uh, from the discovery cohort, there are 55 uh, confirmed donors, as far as we can, uh, are able to ascertain. And um, we hope to increase these numbers significantly because uh, it is a, a, a very precious resource for research. And uh, not, not only is the, the idea that neuropathology can shed light from a, a very specific angle uh, into the mechanisms of Parkinson's disease, but it's uh, one also must bear in mind that technology, the, the, the techniques, keep evolving. So compared to 100 years ago, we are able to capture much more information from the same tissue uh, with biochemical techniques and histopathological techniques. Um, I encourage you to visit the website, Parkinson's UK. It, there is a part, there is a uh, <coughs> specific uh, section where questions are answered relating to brain donation. <coughs> I had a chance to chat with some of you even over the phone and uh, there are some recurring questions. Uh, and these are very well addressed on, on the website, very practical questions. And also, uh, please feel free to get in touch with myself or Dr. Laura Parkinen. She's a senior clinical research fellow in neuropathology. And there's also a helpline. And thank you for your attention.